So for those of you who do not know, my name is Dr. Kara Jefferson, and I am program director for the DNP or Doctor of Nursing Practice program here at Frontier Nursing University. And this is one of the quarterly question and answer information sessions that I do each term. So welcome. So we like to start off by first telling you what our mission here is at Frontier Nursing University. Our mission is to provide accessible nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner education that integrates the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We transform healthcare by preparing ethical, compassionate, innovative, and entrepreneurial leaders to work with all people with an emphasis on rural and underserved communities. So we fit very nicely into this whole thing in the DNP because number one, you come here and we already know that all of you are ethical. We already know that you're compassionate because that's one of the reasons you became a nurse and then an advanced practice registered nurse or APRN. And you either are already innovative in a disruptive way or you want to be more innovative and our program also gives you the opportunity be to become an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur. We teach leadership throughout our entire DNP program. We are not specifically focused on leadership, but it is heavily embedded into everything that we do. So what we'll cover today is, well, number one, why should you come to FNU to get your DNP when there are so many DNP programs out there? Why should you even get your DNP degree? what our programs of study look like, what our admissions criteria are. We'll talk a little bit about our DNP project, what that looks like, um, things you can expect, how to get started, and what we do with our DNP professional advising sections. So here at Frontier, we have something called the culture of caring. Normally I have my little culture of caring or uh, my little picture right next to me, but it is actually on my other desk. But the great thing about Frontier is we know how to do distance education. We have done it for many, many years, even before COVID. So we have gotten really, really good at getting together the things that you need. And the best thing about distance education is that your home community actually becomes your classroom. So sometimes you can be sitting in your bed with your laptop doing your homework or sitting on the couch or sitting at the table. But even more than that, your DNP project is done in your community, in the community that you already serve so that we're not taking anything out of that community. We're actually adding to that. And also with distance education programs, it's your time, right? So there may be some classes where you have mandatory sessions to attend, but the majority of our DNP curriculum live sessions are usually held asynchronously, which means that you can do them mostly when it fits your life. Like once you get into the actual project, that's a little bit different, but our didactic courses are structured so that you make the time for it and we are very respectful of that time. One of the other things that we have you do to marry the two and get to know me as well as the DNP faculty and some of the staff around campus is we bring you on campus for an experience that we call DNP bound. Um, that is our orientation. Our campus is located in Versailles, Kentucky. I know that's a little bit weird for some people to say, because when we see the word, we think of Versailles like France, but I promise you in Kentucky, it is called Versailles. And that is the thing that most students truly welcome the most because they truly enjoy that experience. So as I mentioned, our campus is in Versailles and this is what it looks like. The top left picture is of one of the how where students stay when they're housed on campus. The middle picture at the top is the president's house. And the third picture, the last picture up top is the welcome center. The bottom left picture 
is just an overall view of campus. In the middle is the dining hall because everybody's always concerned about what they're going to eat. And the last picture is just something of our sign that you see when you enter our campus. Oh, I skipped. Let's see. Sorry. So, as I said before, we know how to do distance education. We have over 80 years of experience in graduate nursing and midwifery education. Our students and our alumni represent every state as well as some international places for our DNP. We have well over 8,000 graduates from Frontier as a whole, over 1,100 graduates just in the DNP. And all of that makes us the great place for you to come and get your DNP. We've also had several other achievements. We have received um, the Insight into Diversity Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award. So we call that the HEAT Award in 2023. But not just that, not just 2023, we're actually a six-time recipient of that award. We have been recognized in 2021 and 2022 as one of the great colleges to work for. And in 2021, we received an International Distance Learning Award presented by the USDLA, um, which we're really proud of. So as you can see from this, we are real big on the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion. It's in our mission statement. It's in some of the awards, but also one of the great colleges to work for. But one of the things that I think that we really pride ourselves on the most is our student support. So that is what we are all here for. The faculty, the staff, the administration, we are here because of you and because of your, de your desire to advance your education. So we have online student support groups that are generally led by students. We also have student SIGs or student interest groups for a variety of topics so that you can get together and support other students who may have common interests or similarities that you have. We have faculty who are willing to mentor you, not just in your courses, but also to become outside mentors for your professional career. Student support also includes our financial aid office, our student advisors, um, our ad academic advisors, our librarians, our writing support specialists. And then one of the other things that makes us a little bit unique is that we have something called a diversity impact program that we do once a year. It's an event. It is now held virtually where it used to be held on campus where we get a whole bunch of speakers to speak on a whole bunch of topics. And it's just really, it's a fantastic experience and students really, and faculty really, really enjoy it. So I have already introduced myself to you, Cara Jefferson, director of the DNP program, but it doesn't stop there. I am like the top layer of the DNP program, but we also have course coordinators for every course in the DNP program, as well as course faculty. As I said, you will have everybody who enters will be assigned an academic advisor, as well as a financial aid officer. And then once you get closer to your project, you will meet with one of our credentialing coordinators. We have one specific for the DNP, which makes my life and your life easier. So we're all talking about the same person. And the pictures at the bottom are just a small representation of the people. The other thing that we have that was not mentioned up here was our incredible, incredible IT team. So let's move into why you should get a DNP. I get asked this question so many times, and honestly, I think that the answer to this question, a lot of it is really individualized. It depends on your personal and professional goals, but the DNP is a clinical doctorate degree, which means most people who go for their DNP aren't getting into the DNP because they want to do research. They're getting into the DNP because they want to translate evidence-based practice, best practices into what is actually happening at the bedside, in the clinic, with your real populations. We know that quality improvement, it takes an average of 17 years 
to get something that is written in a book or a journal as best practice to actually implement it. And so our DNP degree here at Frontier is heavily focused on quality improvement and quality improvement and quality assurance theory. But more than that, you become an expert. Our goal is to be able to teach you the quality improvement process so that you can take this and apply it to any other project in your work setting, in your life, because you become an expert at this one topic. And then when you leave, you can become an expert at all these other things, but we are giving you the tools to succeed and view healthcare in a whole new way. We like to view this from a systems approach rather than the very, very minute approach that we normally view things as because we're all in different settings. And with us all being in different settings, our foci are a little bit foci are a little bit different. But the DNP allows you to put all of this together and view healthcare in a different way. I would almost say a more meaningful way. Um, and you also get a terminal degree. This is also the time that I like to talk a little bit about, well, what you know, you're here today to learn more about the DNP. But what's the difference between a DNP versus a PhD versus a um, doctorate in education or even uh, for the midwives out there? Why should I get why should I get a DNP instead of doctorate of midwifery? Well, this is where you get to have options. If your goal is to do research, then I highly, highly recommend a PhD. If your goal is to be the midwifery provider who only does midwifery and only ever wants to focus on midwifery, then yes, consider a doctorate of midwifery. But that doctorate will not expose you to all of the other disciplines that you get with our DNP program. And our DNP degree, as I hinted to earlier, is more than just a leadership degree. It's more than just a quality improvement degree. It's more than just something that you can get that will allow you to teach when you're finished. It's actually a conglomeration of all those things. And we also give you the entrepreneurial savviness to go out if you want to open up your own practice. You get more stuff, um, information about health policy and advocacy. So we really are a big package thing. Whereas if you go all the other routes, you're getting a degree for a singular purpose, not just this one thing. I can tell you that based on surveying our current DNP students, the majority of them get a DNP because they want either their terminal degree, they want to advance their career and become either a nurse educator or a nurse executive or even earn more in their current jobs. I can't promise that to you. That is completely dependent upon where you work after you get your DNP degree. But those are some of the most common and also impact policy. If you really want to talk to the policymakers and the people who are making big decisions about what is happening in APRN practice, you want a terminal degree because then you are more respected by the people who are actually having the money to impact and help you make those changes. So I could talk about that all day, but let's move on and talk a little bit about the admissions criteria into the DNP. So at Frontier, in order to be admitted, you have to have a Master of Science in Nursing, a Master's of Nursing, or a Master's of Science in Nursing or a related field. You must have a current active registered nursing license in the United States with no encumbrances. So it doesn't matter what state you have a registered nurse license in. You just have to have a registered nice nurse license without any encumbrances on it. You have to have national certification as a certified nurse midwife or a nurse practitioner. It doesn't matter um, which one of those. You must have at least a 3.0 grade point average, and you must be able to pass a background check. Those are the bare minimum criteria. We also have something here at Frontier that we call the direct admissions process for current MSN students. 
So we have a subset of population. Frontier Nursing University is a school where we only have advanced practice nursing degrees. So we're very different from many of the other universities that have all these other departments like a biology department and a chemistry department or a math department. No, we only do APRN licensure. So those people have the same thing, but the direct admissions process for current students is a little bit more streamlined because we already have a whole bunch of those other documents. So you, they still write a narrative statement and also still get a background check. One of the things that people always ask us about are the programs of study. So we have currently a postmaster's DNP program of study, which is 30 credit hours. And then we have a companion DNP program of study, and that's for the frontier students who are going to transition into our DNP program as soon as they finish that MSN program. The current postmaster's program of study is 18 months or about six terms where you begin your DNP clinical project in term three. As someone who does quality improvement all the time, I can also tell you that even though the program is listed to be 18 months or six terms, I just looked at the data and the average DNP student right now is actually taking about 7.78 .7 terms. So about eight terms in order to complete their DNP, which is a little bit more, but you can slow down your plan of study to actually fit your life's needs. At Frontier, we have a term system in which students are actively engaged in courses for 11 weeks of the term, and then you are off on break for two weeks of the term. I highly encourage everybody to make use of those breaks, reconnect with your family and friends because you've really done an intense term of work and everybody needs a break. So one of the messages that I always try to communicate here and anytime that you speak to me is that people are important. Your well-being and your health are important, whether that's mental, physical, emotional, all of those things. And so I encourage people, once you're in the program, if you're having any challenges, talk to me, talk to your academic advisors, because generally we can figure out a way to help you slow down your program of study or do what is needed so that you're able to get the most learning out of the program, but also not drive yourself crazy. So you will notice that there are a couple of things on here that are, or that have an asterisk. Those things are three courses. In our current companion DNP program, students who are in our MSN have been allowed to take three courses that are in the DNP as part of their MSN program. Those courses are PC702, Epidemiology and Biostatistics, PC 713, which used to be called Principles of Independent Practice, but is now called Fundamentals of Business and Finance and Advancing Healthcare, and then PC 718, which is Evidence-Based Practice. These courses, people had to elect in them in advance, so if you've already taken some combination of those courses, we look at those to determine if they'll still be counted, but if you are coming into the DNP program, as a postmaster student and you have not taken any of our courses, this is the didactic courses that are part of our program. The other courses include PC 711, Nurses Educator, PC 727, Ethics and Health Policy, and PC 728, Leadership and Organizational, Organizational Dynamics. All of our courses are taught at the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy, which means they are all application level. So you don't just take these courses and never apply anything in the courses that you take. You start applying the information in those courses as soon as possible. And then again, once you get into the DNP project. So what we're doing is really scaffolding the content all throughout. These courses that we, you do in your DNP 
here at Frontier are not the same as MSN courses that you may or may not have taken at another university. As I said, a lot of the courses that you take in your or may have taken in your MSN were not always at the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy. When you come to DNP bound, we talk a little bit more about what the course transfer process looks like, how to determine if your courses are eligible for transfer, and then we move on from there. But in addition to the DNP didactic courses, there are what we now call the DNP clinical courses, but I like to call the DNP project courses because I think the word clinical often confuses people because it's not the same as your MSN courses, the way that we do things here at Frontier. So the first course that we have is something called PC739, which is our DNP clinical preparation course where we are preparing you to look at your project, look at your organization and determine what your needs are. And then we have PC740, which is your project planning course where you devote 20 to 30 hours a week to your project and you must spend at least two days a week on site, whatever that looks like that you coordinate between your faculty, um, your continuity faculty advisor and your site sponsor and mentor. Then we have PC743, which is our project implementation course, where you spend 26 to 30 or more hours per week actually implementing your project within your site. And we have a minimum requirement uh, that you must be on site at least three days per week. And then PC744, which is our project dissemination course, where you'll spend about 11 to 20 hours per week. And our only requirement is that you have an on-site final DNP presentation. There are usually a whole bunch of questions surrounding all of these courses, what they entail. And in order for me to keep the session as streamlined as possible, I prefer not to get into the nuances of every single course, but I will elaborate on what we mean by on-site and those qualifications, especially the project part, later on in the presentation. So this portion is just really an overview of kind of what our courses are in the program and what they look like. So the DNP bound, I talked a little bit about, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about DNP bound on this slide. Our DNP bound is our orientation experience where DNP students come to campus for a two and a half day orientation experience. We talk about what it is to be a doctoral student. We talk about the different courses. We have you um, meet, do a Q&A session with some of our current students so that you really get the student experience. I can tell you that all of the project faculty have all attended Frontier for their DNP. So they all also have a wealth of experience in this area. But it's also a way for you to feel connected, ready to begin your DNP journey and inspired to start your DNP journey while also meeting some of the other people who will be in your class or cohort. So it is a wonderful experience. We give you those dates ahead of time. In fact, they're already published on the portal page. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to get to know you as a person one-on-one. -on -one. As I said, we have six practice-oriented didactic courses, and then we have our DNP project, the actual project courses that you implement over three terms, plus the pre-planning project course. The upcoming application deadlines are January 10th and April 3rd, 2024. If you want to begin your coursework in April, then your deadline is January 10th. And if you want to begin in July, then you would need to have all of your application materials in by April 3rd. The application steps are quite easy. We have an online application. You have to write an essay and that, rest, that essay for postmaster students is currently about the AACN essentials and what you think of them, but there's also a time management essay. If you are a current um, student in our MSN program or thinking or entering the program as a companion DNP student, 
you only write one of those essays. You also submit your resume. So this is my plug for you. You should be thinking about what your resume or CV looks like right now. And also thinking about what it, it what else you have done that maybe you haven't written on there. So maybe you have been a chair of XYZ committee at your job or an external organization or a leading nurse practitioner or nurse midwifery organization. Add that to your resume or CV. If you've done community service activities, add that. Anything that you have done that strengthens your resume or CV, you want to make sure that it is on there. If it's not on there, then it looks to us like you haven't done those things. If you've presented at a national conference, if you have published in a journal, in a peer reviewed journal, make sure all of those things are on that resume or CV. Cause we really do look at those and take those things very seriously. And those things could be the difference between your application and somebody else's application. If we're looking at our, um, who to admit and maybe who to put on the wait list. You also need health professional references. I will tell you that as somebody who looks at application files, the most meaningful references for the DNP program tend to come from your immediate supervisor. We know that students as a whole or people applying to anything generally ask people who know you the best to write these reference letters because they know you. And they like you, but sometimes when people know a lot about you, they don't always provide the opportunities for you to grow and learn. And so we really want to hear from a direct supervisor. Also, that lets us know that you already potentially have some buy-in on your project because they're supporting you in getting your DNP. And then, of course, we need transcripts. One of the other things that we are really proud of here at Frontier is that our tuition for our DNP program is actually the same as our tuition currently for our MSN program. All of this, including our programs of study, are subject to change, but I feel like it's important to mention that we are one of the least expensive DNP programs in the nation as of right now, and we currently currently charge $665 per credit hour. If I could, I'd put a big asterisk by that because tuition is also subject to change, but I feel like it's important because finances are something important for you to look at as you're considering embarking on your DNP journey. So we've talked about this a little bit. How do you begin the DNP? Well, like I said, there's two methods of entering the direct admissions. If you are a currently enrolled MSN or PGC student at Frontier Nursing University, you would go to the portal page, look for that application page and enter the direct, use the direct admit application. If you are an APRN who did not attend Frontier or are currently not enrolled in our MSN program, you attended some other university for your MSN degree, or you have not been enrolled as a student right now, you would submit the standard application. So the method that you enter for the DNP is dependent upon when you graduate and when you want to begin the DNP courses. This is also my plug-in that if you are a current MSN student, I highly, highly encourage you to look at your current degree audits. And at the very, very bottom of the degree audit, I think it's in blue. Um, at the very bottom of your degree audit, there is a link and it gives you guidance on more of the process if you're a currently enrolled student. So I will actually stop screen sharing and use this as an opportunity for me and our admissions team to answer questions about that you may have put in the chat or that you would like to ask us. So please feel free to unmute. For those of us that are planning on taking like a term off, I should graduate with my MSN sometime in February and planning on taking one term off and then coming back for the DNP. Am I still a direct admission? 
it, you would need to, I don't have that document up in front of me, but if you go to your degree audit, it is all laid out and it tells you if you take a turn, if you're going to take a term off, then you're able to do this or if not this. Okay. And then I also wondered about the references because I might not be working at the time that I submit that application. So, right. so would then you would get, you would get whoever you can get right now. So like, if you're thinking about doing the application, I always say that sooner is better than later. We currently have a rolling admissions process. So as soon as the applications open, you are able to submit stuff early. You don't have to wait until the deadline um, to submit anything. But honestly, with the references, you just want to do your best and really get people who can evaluate your potential for leadership to be able to you really have do the of who that would of who that might be for someone who isn't employed right now. Okay. So have you had a nursing instructor from the past? What nursing instructor or the course coordinators from Frontier be okay? If, if they are willing to write your letter, then yes, that would be okay. Anybody who has even worked with you in the past and knows your work ethic, those would all be great people. Okay. Thank you. Whether it's academic or clinical, either one. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. I have two questions. Um, my first one, if um, if we were to apply and be accepted into the program, is there any opportunity to defer for one year if um, at the time we make that decision that's best for us? That's a great question. So currently the way that our admissions process works is if you apply and you get accepted, you are allowed to defer for one term, but we can't defer for a year. Okay. Because our systems change and sometimes the admissions criteria, not the criteria themselves, but sometimes we have a waiting list. And so whatever we we set as like minimum criteria that can change depending upon the other people who are also applying. Okay, thank you. My other question is, do you know what percent of your DNP students wind up publishing their work that they do in the program um, in academic journals? That's a great question. I don't have the specific percentage, but I can tell you that we, it is honestly based on the individual. Right. So when I say that, what I mean is there are some students who come into our DNP program who do not have a desire to publish at all. And that's OK. We're not a program that forces you to publish. But those students who do want to publish, we help each and every one of them to reach their goal. So, for example, I am working with one of my faculty and one of their students who identified early on that she wants to publish her paper. She already, she sent it to one journal. It was not accepted. And so now I'm working with them to figure out, like identify the gaps and the new journal that they can submit to. So any student who decides that they want to publish, and we hope that that's a whole bunch of you, we work with you to get it published. But if publishing is not something that you ever want to do, we don't force you into it. Does Perfect. that answer your question? Yes, thanks so much. You're welcome. I have a question about um, the start, the admission deadlines and start dates. Are there any other options or are they just January deadline, April deadline for? So they open the, yeah, so the system opens up and we always have two applications open at a time. So as this year, as we probably get closer to that, January application deadline, the next one is going to open. Okay, but there there are no start dates later in the year, like in the fall. Oh yes, there always is. There's oh, okay. also every single we offer every so our DNP program is also unique in that we offer every single course every single term, mm -hmm. but we also start winter, spring, summer, and fall every year. Four terms. Okay. And and where do you find the the other deadlines for like fall admission? They just update. They are not up yet. They will update that on the website. Okay. Is that right? I'm, I'm going to verify that 
Richard is here. He works with our admissions team. So Richard, do you have any more guidance on the later application dates? Yes. Hello, everybody. And the, the furthest posted right now is fall 2024. And that application will open up April 4th of next year. And then the deadline's June 26th. And then coursework for fall of 2024 begins um, October 7th of next year. And I posted that in the chat as well. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Mm -hmm. So Jess said, I graduated FNU in 2019. I believe I read that I am still able to apply for my companion DNP and go through the program that way. I believe I saw until 2026. I am able to continue into the companion DNP. So yes, Jess, you would apply as this whole, the verbiage is a little bit confusing for people. So if you did your, though, and you took PC702. I, I did take those three courses. Yeah. Perfect. So once you apply and get in, then whoever's assigned as your academic advisor, you'll fill out a form for me to go and review those courses. Mm -hmm. And then once I accept them, then you get, you would be considered still to have, um, you would be considered a postmaster's, but a companion, all of it's a direct, you would be, con yeah, it's confusing, but yes, we would accept uh, I, those things. I have one other question. Um, so we won't find out if we got accepted until after the deadline. So after January, no, we have rolling admissions. So okay, you are notified. Out. Yes. As it, as it Thank continues. You. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Tara asked, can it be at your place of work? Yes. We'll talk a little bit about more of that in a minute. Um, and Tara, which courses are you asking about at Georgetown? Um, I think we are, I already did ethics, uh, professional nursing. So Georgetown, they put all the masters as like courses at DNP level. Cause they wanted everyone to get the DNP. So I think I, I think I have all the curriculum except for three classes at Frontier already done at uh, uh, DNP level. Okay. So, yeah. So once for, we get to DNP bound, like once you apply, go to DNP bound, we talk a little bit more about that. Um, I love that they do that because that's similar to what we did with the companion and we accept nine, um, nine hours of transfer credit. And thank you, Richard, for putting that in the chat. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And, and Gabrielle says, what if you aren't working? We're going to talk about that in the next section. So hang, hang on with me for a little bit. Um, what else? Does your MSN degree have to be conferred prior to starting FNU's DNP courses, or can some of the didactic work begin a month prior to getting your MSN degree? So if you are currently one of our um, MSN students, we do allow you to begin the DNP didactic courses. You have that, you have a one term. So that very first term of your work, we allow you to complete that, but you have to have taken and passed your boards by the end of that term in order to complete, to continue on. So, um, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Carr. No, go ahead. Um, hello there. Uh, Hi. Questions, so one of them is for the frontier bound, if we are graduates from frontier graduates, we're still coming for specifically for the DNB bound. Yes. So okay. if you are, that's a great question, actually. If you are a frontier graduate who is graduating or has graduated within the past two years, you qualify for our virtual DNP one day bound option. Okay. If you are a postmaster student or have been out of frontier for two years or more then you must come to our in-person two and a half day experience okay that answers the first question and the second question was um for those of us who just graduated this summer um i was under impression from the information i received prior is that we only have two years 
in order to uh, apply for the companion, but I think you have partially already answered that it's kind of complicated and um, it's complicated it in that after. So what happened? I'll explain it to you. So right now, what happened was we had MSN, we had our MSN students take DNP courses, but all of the courses as of January 2024, mm -hmm. every course in our DNP program will have been revised. Okay. And so we are giving grace up until 2026 that if you've already taken those courses that we will accept them. After 2026, we are not accepting those courses and everybody will just have to start over and retake them. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And the only difference if we're applying po after two years is that we're gonna need to, at this point, we're gonna need to come in for in-person uh, clinical bound versus the virtual bound. Correct. So it would be the courses, whether or not you get credit for the courses that you take now versus in-person bound and the other. And so all of the, both of those things actually affects your plan of study and the amount of time it takes to completion. Okay. And if you can elaborate on um, the 18 credits, which takes about six terms, but at the same time, most of the students are taking closer to eight terms. Yes. So um, one of the things that we do at Frontier is not everybody is in a rush. And so I always tell people in order to maximize your learning and your growth, there's no point in rushing through, right? Some people are really committed to their clinical jobs or their family. And so for them, taking two courses at a time is not realistic based on our current plan of study. So what we do is we slow down the plan of study to meet their needs. And that's why on average, because I look at the data to see how much time people are taking, mm -hmm. it's different. So the numbers, the data shows that students today are taking longer, whereas before COVID students were finishing the program in an average of six terms, but now it's closer to eight terms okay. just because of commitments. All right. And I have the last question. Um, is there a maximum amount of time or terms that we can um, finish yes. our program? Because, for example, in my MSN, I had two serious emergencies happen, family emergencies, and I had to take a term off one time, and the other one, I had to drop two classes. Yes. So that's a great question. I think it's in the next half, but I'll just okay. answer it right now. If you are a companion DNP student, meaning you have taken our MSN and you're going now into your DNP, you have two years to complete your degree. If you are a postmaster student, you have two and a half years to complete your degree. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think that answers Amanda's question too, um, because yes, you're able to take one course at a time instead of two courses at a time. And um, Richard, can I ask you to post a link to the curriculum, please, in the chat for Tara? Yes, miss. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So if we don't have any other questions for that, I am going to move on into the next portion of this. And screen share again. All right. So now we will go into the DNP program and then you'll be able to ask me questions about that. Because the project is really the most exciting part for most people. And so this is what we do. This is my love. This is my passion. I will tell you before I go into this that I was one of the people who was very reluctant to get my DNP degree. I did not think that it was necessary, but honestly, I was already doing some of the things that a DNP prepared scholar would do, but the DNP degree just gave me a bigger picture, a systems level. It blew my mind. And if you talk to even some of our current DNP students, they'll tell you how 
their view of the entire healthcare system has in fact changed. One of the big important things for our DNP, since we are quality improvement, leadership, all the things based, is that you know that you will need to be able to select a project topic or what we like to call a project gap. And that project gap, your whole premise of your project is around closing or bridging the gap between what is currently in the literature and what is currently happening within your site. And so all of our projects here at Frontier are driven by the needs of the site, which means they're generally not your passion project. They are generally something that you have spoken to the quality improvement or the quality insur quality assurance department about. Some, of, some sites don't have those things. Some sites instead have quality improvement listed under their research department, whatever that is. We all know that as APRNs, that there are metrics that we are meant to achieve. And generally, we're not all at 100%. You show me a site that's at 100% and... I will be really surprised because we all generally have some kind of deficit somewhere. So you're looking at those things to kind of get an idea of where there are gaps that you could potentially help to close with your pilot project. All of our projects are held within a clinical setting, which means you're not doing a project because you now work in academia with your other faculty, or you're not doing a project at your church. You are actually doing it unless your church has its own clinic. You're actually doing it in a clinical setting. And we are highly, highly, highly focused on patient outcomes. Patient outcomes does not equate to patient diagnoses. So a lot of our projects are diagnosis driven, depression, obesity, anxiety, whatever, but they do not have to be. Every last one of our projects is also focused on one of the six Institute of Medicine project uh, aims of medicine, safe, effective, patient-centered, efficient, timely, or equitable care. And all projects have some degree of patient engagement as well as team engagement because as a DNP scholar, even as an APRN, it is highly unusual for you to work alone on anything. You have to work within a team and working within a team, especially in interdisciplinary or interprofessional team, it allows you to expand your reach and think about things that you may not have thought of before. You just get a brand new perspective. We like for our projects to solve a daily problem. So that means that if your pro whatever you think of is not affecting people in your practice every single day or affecting 75 to 80% of your patients on a regular basis, then it's not a good idea for a project topic. You want something that you can get the most bang out of your buck. So you want to be able to impact the greatest number of people in a short time to see if this is truly a change that you can sustain in your clinic because it's just a pilot. And in the pre-planning course, we go over all of this. I assign you um, a faculty member to do your project advising in that course. The good thing is I've also built some of this into DNP Bound, where it's not an individualized counseling session that you get, but we do big group sessions. During Bound, we split you up into groups, and you can start thinking about project ideas while you're there, and we kind of tell you what we think about it and where you should go and who you potentially should speak with at your site. But you have a one-to-one -one 30 minute session. Sometimes some students need two 30 minute sessions or even three with the clinical faculty or a project faculty where we set the expectations of the project. We approve or deny project ideas. We meet with you until we feel like you have an idea that will work. We look at your overall program of study and decide, is this the right time for you to be doing your project? Maybe you need an academic hiatus. Maybe you need to slow things down. We look at all of that. But as I said before, I'm very, very big on people and humans, and we are all humans, right? We all have emotions. We all have other things going on, but you cannot be successful in a DNP project if you're having crises every week in your life. And so 
I care about you. And in order to do well, you have to live well. And so you'll always, always, always hear me speaking about work and life balance. And even though some people don't think that it exists, I beg to differ. It does. It just depends on your belief system and how you structure it and your mindset. We also talk about um, the clinical site approval forms as well as clinical credentialing and compliance and whether or not you need it. And, you know, if you have to have or undergo um, IRB, which is Institutional Review Board at your site, because even though we're not doing research, we are doing quality improvement, some sites still make you submit some documents for that. So we go heavily into this during bound. And again, once you get into that pre-project course. And a lot of times we're so early in this process that you actually don't know what you don't know and you don't know what you need. Because like this quote by Henry Ford, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. They'd never envisioned a world where we'd have cars. And that's a lot of times what happens with the DNP program. You don't really know what it is that you're going to get until you're somewhat of a visionary and you're immersed in it. And those are the people that we really want in our programs. And so as you plan ahead, I want you to think about a couple of things. Number one, are you working? If you're working, great. Your workplace is actually the best place to do your DNP project because the way in which we structure our program is you will do your project as you are working. So if, for example, I'm implementing something related to obesity in my clinical site, with my interventions, it's going to be two things related to obesity. I'm doing both of those and incorporating that into my normal clinic workflow, which is considered part of your clinical hours. And then outside of work, that's when you're doing your data, you're entering your data in your workbooks, you're analyzing the data, you're writing it up to how we need it. So if possible, implement at your workplace. But we also know that that's not feasible for everybody because either you're not working as an APRN right now or you're still in between. And so, yes, you can absolutely implement for our DNP projects within your registered nurse role. You do not have to implement it as the provider of XYZ. You can implement your project on a hospital unit as long as you get permission. So the big takeaway here is you need a site and you need site buy-in for your project. And you need to know the specific requirements of your site to be able to do all of that. If you volunteer somewhere to do your DNP project, I encourage you to think very, very carefully about how much time you realistically have. Because if you're working in one site, and then have to volunteer at another, how will you realistically be able to meet the needs of our courses, the two days per week in planning, and the three full days per week implementation? So that's very challenging for a lot of our students. So think through it before you get in a position where, oh my gosh, you feel so overwhelmed that you can't do it. It's okay. I'm not asking you to be superwoman. I, in fact, don't want you to be superwoman or superman. I want you to be you. And I want you to do what works best for you. So you also want to consider when you will be starting a new job as an advanced practice registered nurse. For example, there's a whole population of you who are just graduating from your MSN. If you plan to begin the DNP as a companion, you're actually going to start those DNP project courses sooner than if you were a postmaster student, just because you've already taken some of those other courses. So if you're going to be transitioning to a new job, you can't start your project at one site and continue it at another site. You have to spend the entire project planning, implementation, and dissemination all at one site, which means that you have to be there for a bare minimum of six months. 
I say six months because dissemination, the only requirement is that you present within the site. So we have had instances where students started a project, finished their project, moved out of state, and then came back for the one day to do their final project presentation. So these are all things that I just want you to consider. It's also very difficult for you to be planning a project while you're onboarding to a new job. So allow yourself some grace. You should not be doing, doing, doing all the time. You actually do need to allow your parasympathetic nervous system time to rest and digest and recharge so that you can be at your best. Also think about the major life events going on. Do you have a family member that you have to care for because they're ill? Do Are you potentially adopting a child or pregnant and you need time to adjust as potentially a new parent? Are you moving from one state to another or even dare I say, we've had DNP students move from one country to another? Consider that. How does your life look like? Envision it. Have a plan. But also, what does your work schedule look like? Does this fit in? Is it something that maybe you're considering this and maybe you have to go a little bit slower? It is okay to go a little bit slower. This is not a race to the finish line. We only hold commencement one time a year, and that commencement ceremony is generally at the end, middle to end of September. So rushing through it is never our goal. We want you to take back actionable steps that you can live with and have a repeatable process that you can do over and over and over again. And it involves your life. School is not your only time commitment. So I always encourage you to think about these things. So the distance between who I am and who I want to be is only separated by my actions and words. Are your actions and your words congruent? It is perfectly fine for us to want a DNP, but is the timing right for the DNP? It's also perfectly fine for us to want to do it in 18 months, but maybe realistically we only have enough time to do it in 24 months. Just be cognizant of this and follow your heart and follow your mind. And at the end, it will lead you exactly where you need to be. So there will be obstacles. There will be doubters. There will be people asking you, why are you getting your DNP? What is the return on investment? You will make mistakes. We all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. But with hard work and perseverance, there really are no limits to what you can accomplish. If you have any additional questions pertaining to financial aid, please email financialaid at frontier.edu. If you have any questions related to admissions, feel free to email fnuadmissions at frontier.edu. And if you have project-specific questions, my email isn't up here, but you can absolutely email me at kara.jefferson at frontier.edu. And now I will open it up for questions. This is one of our former Frontier graduates from our DNP program, and you can see the excitement and joy on her face from completing our program because it's not an easy feat, but success doesn't come to you. You go after success, and it is very doable because we've had well over 1,100, close to 1,200 students that have already done this. And so I will now stop screen sharing and take questions again. Hi, this is Jessica Bergman. Um, my question is, I already submitted my application. Is there a way besides emailing FNU admissions to make sure that they received everything else? Because I contacted, you know, the midwifery board and my board of nursing just to make sure that they received everything or is there like a checklist somewhere that they mark that I, that they received it all or, you know what I mean? Yes. Richard, do you have any insight into that? Yes. We could follow up with you, Jessica, because, um, or we could give you a call, whatever works best for you. Are you going to be available after this session yep. concludes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I believe I've submitted everything. I just get anxious that I did not. 
<laughs> Understandable. Yeah, me or a colleague, we'll follow up with you right after the session concludes here. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And this is Albina Rudnichenko. Hi, Albina. Hi. Um, in regards of the actual courses, the clinical implementation courses, um, I think for the PC 40, 740, 43, uh -huh. 44, there's different amount of <clears throat> clinical hours. And when we're saying, um, for example, 740, 20 to 30 hours per week on site, correct? Yes. So in, so in PC 740, that is our planning course. When I say, when I, and I may have misspoken when I say 20 to 30 hours per week, that is what you can expect to do from mm -hmm. your meetings with stakeholders, from your coursework and from being there because you have certain assignments that fall into that. That's the 20 hours per week, but the two days per week, it doesn't have to in PC 740. It's not always cut and dry that you have to be on site for eight hours a day, two days a week. Some students choose to do the, you know, working with their site or having meetings or doing some of the other projects that they have to do on site. They might do two hours one day or four hours one day or break it up any kind of way. But for most people, it's, it requires at least two days a week. The difference is that implementation, you must be on site actively working your DNP project and being the project manager for three days a week. And mm -hmm. then you still have outside work to do. Yeah, of course. Um, and then when you said that the rest of the, you know, um, synthesis and analyzing we can do at home, how much time in addition to those, for example, 20, 30 hours in general, it takes for students to spend on home, um, you know, it, it honestly varies. I actually looked at the course evals and you have students who write a multitude of things, right? But generally it's falling in the 25 to 30 hour range, all of it, because so your clinical hours are calculated by you doing your project on site, actively working with your patients yeah. on site, but then you still have the actual assignment portion Right. And so it's the data input. So I usually tell people on Friday nights or on Friday, input all of your data, walk away from it on Saturday, start doing some of the data calculations and start maybe a little bit analyzing it and then walk away from it. And then on Sunday, cause our, in the DNP, most of our assignments in the project part are due on Sunday night at 11 59 PM. Mm -hmm. That's not the same for the didactic courses, just to be clear, but for the project, the majority of the coursework in PC 740 and 743 are due on Sunday at 11 59. So I tell people on Sunday, that's when you're actually going to sit down and do the write up because mm -hmm. it's easier if you do it in steps, then what happens is we now have students who wait until Sunday sometimes Sunday evening to start the whole thing. And that is not enough time to get your assignment completed at all. It's better if you're working on it a little bit at a time as you go, or even inputting the data every day, that actually makes life easier for most people. Okay. Um, I'm in the process of applying for a position, uh, family practice, and I already tried to, you know, negotiate the hours because the position they have is a full-time FTE. They said they might consider me going down to point eight FTE, which I don't even know how that's going to work um, patient-wise and, you know, days-wise. But what is your, what do you, do you know what in generally, you know, somebody who is doing family practice, do they drop down to three days a week in order to accomplish their work? Um, yeah, so some students actually don't. We have we have a combination in our program of students who do different things, and it depends on what your job defines as 1.0. Like for most people, 1.0 is 40 hours a week, but not yeah. every single site, right? So if they're telling you that you can do point, like you could drop down to point eight, that equates to 32 hours per week. So maybe you're doing 
four days, right? But generally what I sell P students who are asking this question is in PC 740, if there are weeks that you could get days off to do some of the assignments, and it's not every week in PC 740, but it's some of them. The mm -hmm. best day to take off to do that in PC 740 is a Monday. Mm -hmm. But that's different for PC 743, where your best day to take off would be a Friday, oh. right? So we have some students who use their work PTO bank and just take off those days. Mm -hmm. And then we have some students who don't because there are some students who work three 12 hour shifts or four 12 hour shifts or four 10. So it's hard for me to give really specific advice, but just know that, yes, we do have some students that bank on that, knowing that the term where it will require the most, the most time and energy is the implementation term. Mm -hmm. Planning is a lot, but implementation is another level. Yeah. yeah, the 743. Yes. Okay, yeah, I think that answers. Yes, thank you. Oh, and the credentialing, you mentioned something about when we're applying and looking for when we're going to be planning your uh, our pre planning or in the pre planning. Yes, yeah, so what, what kind of credentialing you're talking about? So if it depends, <laughs> everything is a, a kind of it depends, but it depends on if you are doing your project at a site that you are already credentialed as a provider versus mm -hmm. you volunteering in a site. I so see. if you're already credentialed somewhere as a provider, like let's say me, mm -hmm. and they say that it's okay for me to do my DNP project on XYZ topic that they've given me, my clinical credentialing is really simple. I will submit, you know, my CSAF form in PC 739, and I will submit a copy of my site liability insurance and I'm done. Okay. However, if I'm working in a site, but they also want a contract with Frontier anyway, then that's full clinical credentialing. The same thing as if you were volunteering. So it depends. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Gabrielle. Uh who can we talk to in advance of like project ideas to run by them so we're not waiting until that like term before to make sure we're on the right track so we don't my faculty don't have the workload right now to speak to people in advance because then it might be another 100 people that they have to speak to in advance um we allow those questions and talk and to talk about that during bound so, you know, we have a Q&A session with a student during bound, but we also have built-in times where we finish activities early, where we ask, like, do you have an idea? Or sometimes we, I, when I'm there, depending upon the bound, sometimes we like role play and ask questions about like, let's say I have such and such topic and I have one of the other faculties advising me. So mm -hmm. we do that, but we don't do advising in advance of okay. more specific project guidance in advance, because generally I will say that of the people who have a problem moving forward, the problem is generally not that they don't have an approved topic. The problem is that there's generally some kind of site issue or site buy-in issue. Okay. Projects are approved currently probably at least during the first meeting, probably 85% of the time. Okay. And I then, always tell um, people come in with two ideas. I had one other question about the work hours. This may be a silly question, but I don't really know a whole lot about this process. Am I the only one implementing my project or am I trying to implement it site-wide? So that's a great question. We always like for you to start implementing your project because if you were to start implementing a project site-wide and we do rapid cycle iterative change. So if you start implementing and then now you need to change something and then, you know, two weeks later, you have to change something else. The people in your site are not going to be very happy. It's too many changes occurring. So we mm -hmm. like for you to start implementing your project with your patients first, because it allows you to see the problems that may be in, be in existence and you work on those before you start scaling it and spreading it to other people, 
right? So it right. may be that in your first cycle of implementation, it's just you. And maybe it's just you in the second cycle. And then in the third cycle, you bring in one or two other providers, or it's just you. And then the next cycle, you bring in X number of providers. You can decide all of that as the project manager and your faculty help to guide you. So our faculty are what other people consider to be project chairs, where we are truly your guide on the side. And we yeah. get to know you as a person. We get to know what's going on in your site. But generally, we also get to know you and your family. Right. So <laughs> it becomes a we're really close with our students. OK, because you're so with then, somebody for like a year. Yeah. Right. But there is no, I guess. Um, that's the word I'm looking for. There's no requirement because that every site. Me. No, every site is different. And so as the project manager of that site and that project, you pretty much get to set the rules. Okay. as long as they're in alignment with those of your site sponsor and mentor. And I don't think that I mentioned this, but our DNP program does not function on preceptors. A lot of people come into this thinking, I need to go find a preceptor. We don't do that because you're either already an APRN or you will be an APRN within one term of starting this program. And so you don't need somebody to precept you on what you need to do as a DNP scholar. You are actually taking evidence and putting it into practice in the best way that it suits you. So we need a thought leader, somebody who is like, you know, you have a friend who sometimes you turn to for advice. That person is your mentor. You need that person. And then we also have a sponsor who is the person on site who, if you are not in a leadership role, they're the, they're the person who can get people mobilized and get people to be part of your project. So we want you to work in collaboration with people rather than have somebody supervising and looking over your shoulders at you. Thank you. You're welcome. So I always go over on these things because I like to make sure that people understand what it is that we do, what it is that you're getting into, but we are really a supportive group of people. And again, I'm so happy you are considering Frontier for your DNP and please reach out to any of us if you have any questions.